So I'm Lloyd. I work for Fred Hutchison Cancer Research Center in Seattle. Um, and with Inside Fred Hutch, I work for SHARP, which is the Statistical Center for HIV Research and Prevention. We monitor AIDS drug trials around the world, uh, including we have offices here in Johannesburg and in Cape Town. Um, and I'm also one of the organizers of Postgres Conf in the United States. Uh, so we have our big conference in New York. We have some local conferences around in like um, Philly and, and San Jose. Uh, I also run a Postgres track at Linux Fest Northwest. Uh, I run the Seattle Postgres Users Group, and I'm also a contributor, aka bug finder, uh, to Postgres. Uh, so there are uh, fixes in 11 and 12 uh, that all have my name attached to them. Uh, the security fixes are big ones. You want 12 uh, because there's some big stuff in there. 11. Uh, Previously, if you used pgdump and pgdump-all-g to back up your databases, you were missing all the database-level grants. Uh, so connection limits on the database. Uh, if you uh, allowed a user to create schemas in that database, they were not backed up at all. The only way to back them up was to do a pgdump-all as a pure SQL text file to back them up. And now they've added it uh, because I pushed them hard enough to add it. Okay, so shadow tables versus PG audit. I'm going to go through both. Uh, it is a long presentation. Hopefully, I'll get through it in time. Uh, the last time I did this, I was running through the slides at the very end very quickly. Uh, shadow tables we use internally uh, to meet certain criteria uh, for auditing. We are also implementing PG audit for different types of auditing. Uh, they have different purposes. We're going to cover uh, writing shadow table functions. Uh, so to create shadow tables, you can implement it yourself. You don't have to in, uh, do an extension. Uh, you can just add the functions to your database, uh, just plain PSQL functions, PG PSQL functions, and, and be able to do this type of stuff. Where PG audit, you actually have to add an extension, and you have to um, add a shared library also, which means that you have to either own the database server or you have to go with a cloud provider that does support it. I'm going to talk about those cloud providers, uh, which ones support it, which ones don't, what versions they support, things like that. Um, and I'm, we're going to talk about some of the differences between shadow tables and PG audit. In my slide deck, if it's got this post-it note in this upper corner here, that will be, uh, means that if you download the PowerPoint, you will, there will be extra notes at the bottom, including links off to websites that uh, contain more information about what I'm showing on that slide. Shadow tables. Um, generic shadow functions, we're going to talk about that. So we're actually going to go through and actually work our way up to a more advanced uh, shadow function. Uh, with shadow tables, what we do is we want a copy of the data. So it's, a, it's a, like a mirrored table, except you can time travel the table because it has every version of the row in the table. So if you update a row in your primary table, it adds a new entry to the shadow table. So it has both the original row and your new updated row. If you delete the entry in the primary table, it has a record in there showing you that you deleted it. And then if you reinsert, it'll have the new insert record. If you truncate the parent table, you can also have a record in there showing you that you truncated it uh, so that you can go back and do that. Plus, you have who made the change, when they made the change. So you can go and audit who actually made these changes in the database. Because in our situation, we don't have a front-end application that is controlling the database. All our users are able to log in with SAS, R, Python, Excel, um, you know, you name it. We have the whole gamut of, of stuff. So every you, we have 200 some users that have direct access to the data to actually be able to change the data. And so we need to know who changed it and when uh, and be able to audit that and show the federal government that audit log if we need to. Uh, where P 
PG Audit will show some things. It's best for showing who read the data. This is to show who changed the data. Uh, also, you can use that shadow table to roll back to a previous version or to, to find out who, who did it, things like that. Okay. Basic shadow function. Uh, the thing you would need to do is you want to create your table. So we're going to create a very simplistic table example here. Uh, we're going to create a serial ID key uh, for our row. We're going to stick in a value and some text and set our primary key. Very, very simple. In the shadow table, which is table two, we add username, action name, and action time. Uh, now, you may want more than one type of uh, username in there. That's in a future slide. Uh, but these are the three basic things that you want. You know, who made the change, what type of change it was, which is the action. You know, it could be insert, update, delete, truncate, and when the change was made. For a basic set of code here, we uh, create a, fun a trigger function. In this trigger function, we look at TGOP, uh, which is right there, TGOP. And TGOP is, going, is a system variable in PG Audit. And what that does, it's going to have a value of insert, update, delete, or truncate. So we know what operation caused this trigger to execute so that we can do different cases depending on what that value is. Uh, so that we can then have a set of code for insert, a set of code for update, a set of code for delete. Now, the most simplistic way is you insert into your shadow table, table two here, all the original values. And the original values whoops, on an insert will be new values. If it's on an update, you want the new values. If it is on a delete, you want the old values. So in insert, you only you have this um, uh, record type new that's a system type that has all the variable names that uh, are on the insert. If it's on an update, you have both new and old. So inside of a trigger function, you can see both the new and the old values. And then on delete, you only have the old ones. So with that, you can then append to it the current user, and or you can do system user, or you can do both. And then you want the TG operation and the now timestamp, which is unique across your, or it, yeah, it is the same value across your entire transaction. So if your transaction is inserting more than one record, they are all going to have that same timestamp. So you'll know those all happen together. Uh, current user and current uh, session user. Uh, session user is who logged in. And if you then do a set role, the uh, current user will be different than session user. And so in some cases, you, uh, depending on how you, what people are doing in your business, you may want both session user and current user to be recorded. OK, and then uh, you want to, after you do your insert into your shadow table from any one of these three, you want to, if it's an insert or an update, you want to return new. If you are doing a delete, you want to return old. Uh, because, and one of the things that you can do with triggers if you have it ever used these before, is you can actually change the values uh, inside of the new. So if you have uh, an insert, you can actually have it say, oh, they put in this value. We want to replace it with this other value. You can actually do those type of things. And, that, and so you can say new dot and your field name equals and some value. And then you return new, and that new value gets written. That's for before triggers. Uh, so when you create your trigger, it can be before or after, except if you're on a newer version of Postgres, and then you have a third variant, uh, which is in a future slide deck. Um, also, I'm using security definer. 
uh, if uh, John, you'll see security definer here. When you create your function as security definer, then the person who owns the function is the user that the function is being executed as. Uh, this means your shadow table can be owned by the same owner, same owner as the function, and then you grant uh, usage on the function to public, so everybody else can use the function. So when you attach it to your table, the people who have, who are, have read and write access on the table don't have to have read and write access on the shadow table, so they can't actually change the data in the shadow table when you set this with security definer. So that's one of the things uh, that, that I do with that. Uh, because we, we, prevent, uh, we prevent people from actually looking at the shadow table or being able to edit it. Okay. Then, once we've created our shadow function, we can create our trigger. Uh, so we create trigger, we give it a name before insert or update or delete on our primary table for each row, execute, procedure, and our shadow function that we've created. And so you put one of these on each table, and you have a unique shadow table for every table too, and you point it. Uh, so that's the very, very basics. But this design has a problem. You have to create a unique function for each table. So we're actually going to go over and how to do this better so that you can, um, uh, have a single function that will work for all tables. So it'll be table agnostic. Uh, so here's an example of actually using that data. So we insert into our primary table 30 meters. Uh, we insert into the primary table 10 inches. We update uh, our inches to 20. We delete our inches and then we insert 50 inches. So this leaves us in our primary table with 30 meters and 50 inches. But in our shadow table, you can see each variant as it goes through. You can see we inserted uh, the 30 meters. You can see the insert of the 10 inches. You can see the update to 20 inches. You can see the delete of the 20 inches and the insert of the 50 inches. This allows you to see all the changes uh, over time. And you're able to query that with uh, or time travel that table. And you can easily find out the latest values by doing a select distinct on the key where the action time is greater than equal to the current uh, time that you want to look at. And so it'll find you the latest one. Uh, and then you could, uh, if it's uh, delete, you can uh, say where it's um, uh, having uh, not delete in there, and you, and you could uh, strip those out. Okay, so new, f new functions. So now we want to start improving the shadow function. So we can do what's called row expansion uh, with we can use the new and we can do, wrap the new in parentheses dot asterisk. That then does this automatic row expansion for us so we actually don't have to name every individual field. We can just put that in there and it represents every field for us, uh, which is great. So now this function will work for any table. It becomes a universal function. Uh, you can also do that same thing for old, uh, we, for the delete part. Uh, so we don't need to know field names, it's universal, great way to do it. But it's still one function per shadow table due to the fact that we're having to name the shadow table in here. So now we're going to make it even better. Uh, so now, shadow tables can't have 
normal inbound variables, but they have access to some system variables called TGNRGs and TGNRGV. And if you're an old C programmer like I am, NRGs and ARGV are old C variables to tell you the number of variables and the variable values that were inserted on the command line after your program. So that's available in your PLPG SQL so that you can actually ask for how many arguments were supplied. And so we can look in here and we want to create two new variables called shadow underscore schema and shadow underscore text that we're going to take these values and write them into. We want to make sure with the TGN args that it's exactly two values that we're being passed in. Otherwise, you can do this raise exception. Raise exception, actually, hold on, I get that over here, this screen. So the raise exception is how you can throw an error message inside of Postgres, uh, inside of your function. So that will actually make the function error out so that you don't have problems with your code. You can also do a raise notice if you want for debugging purposes. And that'll put an entry into your log file and with some uh, interfaces, it will actually throw that message back out on your screen. So we'll, we want to check that we have the correct number of arguments. Then we take the TG argv and the TG, uh, the two TG arg values, and it's an array of values, so we need to put our bracket zero and one on there and shove those into our shadow schema and our shadow table values. Now we can use those easily with inside of our code. So then we need to update our function, uh, the rest of the function, it becomes much more complex looking now. So now what we do is we can't just write a SQL string because you can't have variables for the table and schema names. So what we have to do is we have to create a, stri uh, a text string that we actually execute. So here we say execute and then we start our string insert into and then we append to that string our shadow schema and our shadow table names. Now you want to use a quote ident anytime you're doing this type of stuff because if you are using spaces, if you're using capital letters, you need to have them double quoted for schema, table, field names, things like that. Bad idea to do it, but people do it. And so if, if you want, have to deal with those type of things, uh, or it's just best to code it this way, uh, do the quote, quote ident around it so that if Postgres sees one of the special characters in there, it will automatically double quote it for you so that you don't have a problem. Then instead of using the now wrapped, we can't use that. So now we have to use this dollar sign one dot asterisk and that will also do the row expansion again for that new um, and uh, because the dollar sign one is what's being fed by using new out here uh, so that uh, then does the row expansion for us and we, pa we also pass in the P T TG operation to the dollar sign two which is our insert update or delete uh, depending on which row you have also, I have a new one down here for truncate uh, where it will insert into the shadow table an entire copy of the table that you were deleting uh, showing every record was deleted. Now, this has some goods and bads. It can be a very large amount of data you're shoving in, but it makes it faster to tra uh, sh uh, time travel the shadow table. Uh, there, that's why this is version one. In version two, I'm going to show you how to do the same thing where you just insert a single row into the shadow table for the truncate. It's just, it's more complex in your code to time travel it. So I show both versions in this uh, presentation. I have both sets of time travel in this presentation to show you both ways. Okay, so here's version two. You'll notice we just enter a single row in here. 
uh, for the truncate, but we're not putting in a key value uh, or, or, or any of that type of stuff in there. Uh, we're just putting in your username and your action and your action time. Um, but it will slow down uh, uh, your queries. Although you can imp improve them by adding some specialized indexes, uh, which I also talk about later. Okay, so the end of your function, this stayed the same. Oh, by the way, there is a zip file uh, uh, along with the slide deck that actually contains all this code so you don't have to try and copy it and paste it in and out of the slides. Um, so now, when we add it, uh, the first one is the same, except when we come over here, we actually add the schema and table name. We're passing that into the, sh into the shadow function. So now we're using a generic shadow function and just pass it the schema t and table name of our shadow table that is specific to the table we're monitoring. Uh, so we're doing the, uh, otherwise it's basically the same for the insert, update, and delete. The truncate is statement-based. It's not row-based. So we have to do for each statement, and that's why it has to be a separate uh, trigger execution. Uh, but you do it the same uh, type of way there. Okay, so now uh, if we're progressing our sample along, we want to clear out our tables and so that we can redo our sample. So you can do a truncate and you can select both table names there. Uh, this is uh, really important if you have foreign key relationships, you can put all the table names together, comma, uh, together to be able to do your truncates. Um, okay, so now if we do our insert of our 30 meters, insert of our 10 inches, update our inches to 20, um, delete our inches, insert our 50 inches, truncate the table, insert our 50 inches, delete the inches, and insert the 30 meters, which leaves us with just 30 meters in our table one. But now we can see every one of those in this table two down here, including the two lines that were in there when it did the truncate. Because in this example, in, in version one, we're showing every row that was actually truncated. With Version 2 here, you'll see it has no data in there. It just shows that the truncate happened. So that's why it's more complex when you want to time travel to find out what was the value of every row before that truncate or, or, or just after it. Um, it's, it's a little bit more complex with the truncates, as you will see in the future code. Time travel. And, uh, uh, I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with Doctor Who, but I do happen to be a Doctor Who fan. So, and I thought that was, that was an appropriate uh, representation. Uh, so, so we want to get in our TARDIS and we want to time travel back and look at the table. So for version one, we can look at it really easily. We can do uh, our subselect with the uh, distinct on of our key, uh, we're getting every field from our shadow table where our action time is less than or equal to the time that we wish to look at. And we want to order by our key and our action time descending. The order by is very important for your select distinct on because your select distinct on is only going to return you the first matching row. And that's why, so for your key, you only want one row returned. And for action time, you want the latest action time. So that's why the action time must be descending. If you had it as ascending, it would give you the oldest one. And so that's why you do that. And then uh, the outer statement, you want to say where action time is an update or insert, because you want to throw away all your deletes, all your truncates. And then you can see the query results here to show you what was valid at that time. So now you can see that, that data. 
Okay, so version two, you can see, is a lot more complex. Uh, it is just not as easy, not as nice, but your shadow table will be smaller. Um, two, two, two. And create an index on key and action time. Uh, an action uh, will help this table, especially if your shadow table gets really large. You want to create that index on it. Okay, doing data comparisons over time. Jeez. Um, from current slide. There we go. Okay. Data comparisons over time. What? Okay, fine. No? Is it? Fine. It doesn't want me to do more slides. Uh, wait a minute. I'm changed slides. off. How did it do? Come on. End the slide presentation so I can start over. Okay, slide. Ah. I will get back to this from my presentation. Escape. Why aren't you allowing my escape? There we go. From current slide. There we go. Okay. So now we want to compare two versions. So we want to, uh, in this case, I want to look at a specific period in time and compare it to the current uh, table one. And I want to look at, find out what are all the differences. So Postgres has a great command and it's called accept. And that will allow us to compare two data sets and find out what the differences are in those data sets. So we can do our time travel query, except and adjust the select star from our primary table, and this will allow us to see what is in the old data that has been changed in the new data. You can also invert that to see just the opposite. Um, so we can see what's in the new that's not in the old, if I got that right. OK, resetting a table. So sometimes you have somebody who comes along and does a bad action, does a update, and they formatted it wrong, and they just go and trash the table. And then they come back to you and say, hey, we need to restore it. Well, instead of going to that nightly backup, uh, because you want the changes after the nightly backup, but before they made their change, you can time travel the database. So you can begin your trend action, do an alter table disabling the triggers, because you don't want the trigger to put more new data into the shadow table. So you need to disable those triggers. Uh, we leave them in place, we just disable them. Then we truncate our primary table, we insert into our primary table using the time travel query, and that will take our results of our time travel and just bulk insert it. And then we alter the table again, re-enabling the triggers. And then uh, you uh, most likely want to delete anything from the shadow table that was uh, from that point on, that was the bad, tra uh, bad updates, and then commit your uh, transaction. That should actually be commit, not end. So that will uh, allow you to reset your data to just before the, one of your people screwed up the data, which we do have happen. Um, I get people walking to my office all the time to reset this or reload a table from... Uh, from the nightly backups because they've gone and they've screwed the data up. Okay, version two, of course, is more complex, but it's the same type of thing. And how long do I have? Okay, adding shadow tables. Huh? Ten minutes? Oh, geez, I'm not even near close. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, I got another 43 slides to go. Okay. 
Yeah, not getting there. Okay. Um, now, if you want to, you can use uh, this function to add shadow tables easily to existing tables. It'll build you your shadow table. It will add the triggers, uh, put everything in there for you automatically. All the code is on these slides and in the uh, file where the dot, dot, dots, you're inserting the next slides. I'm going to skip over a lot of this because of time, uh, but it is there. There are some caveats for dealing with certain versions of Postgres in here. Um, so yes, uh, yes. Now it will also auto name the, all the shadow tables and everything else. Okay. So then you can just run select add shadow. You give it the schema and table name of your source table, and you give it a schema and table name for your shadow table, and it builds everything for you. If you uh, don't give it certain of the values, like you don't give it the table name, but you just give it the schema for the shadow table, it will um, just use the same table name as your source name, but it'll add uh, an extension at the end of it, uh, so you know it's a shadow table. Uh, if you don't give it schema uh, or table name, it will put it inside the same schema as your source table, and use your source table name underscore uh, the shadow, uh, I -S. Um, uh, the one where you specify the schema, that allows you to put your shadow tables in a different schema than your source tables, which is some of what we do so that the, when the programmers go in, they actually can't see them. Because we've edited uh, the ODBC driver so that the user who logs in can only see objects that they have permissions on, so they can't see all the other objects that they don't have permissions on, so they can't even see the tables in the interfaces they're using. Okay, Postgres 10 adds some great new features uh, to make some of this stuff a whole lot easier because you can process by statement uh, for your triggers. Uh, but you need to create a new one. Uh, you insert, update, and delete have to be separate uh, trigger commands, uh, and then you say uh, referencing new table as new table. So what happens with this is instead of giving, having you a row value, you have a value for the entire set of data that was being inserted, updated, or deleted. So you have all the data in one lump sum, which makes it much more easier to process. Uh, it's just you have to put in these referencing lines for new and old and give it the, the names. Uh, then inside your code, you can reference that uh, as an entire table. So we can say from new table. And so it will insert all the rows into your shadow table, one lump sum, making the trigger function much faster when you're doing bulk inserts, updates, or deletes. Uh, and the add shadow function has to be updated for it. To, to update, uh, yeah, that's just more stuff for updating the function. We'll just skip by a lot of this. Do, 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 pros and cons. So shadow tables, easy to set up. You have a historical copy of the data, but you, this doesn't monitor DDL changes. So if somebody adds a field or deletes a field from the table, it won't, uh, the shadow table won't function properly. You have to create a new shadow table uh, for that new uh, table structure, uh, and you have to do that uh, manually. You have to uh, um, uh, stop stuff and do that. You can, with the new versions of Postgres, actually write uh, uh, triggers that will monitor for DDL changes and log them or even prevent users from doing them if you want. Um, and you don't know who looked at the data, where PG Audit Will, allow, will tell you who actually looked at the data. And part of the latest stuff with the federal government for us is who actually looked at that data. That's important. They want to know that. Uh, so uh, um, that's where you want the PG audit side. Can this be installed on a cloud service? Yes, shadow tables can be installed on any provider because they're not an extension. And they can be provided on all, uh, all the modern versions of Postgres. Uh, cloud services, only some provide PG audit. Uh, 
can be installed without super user privileges for shadow tables. PG Audit requires super user privileges to do it. Um, okay, and uh, you can go back in time and see the values on the tables, which you can't do with Audit. Okay. Oh, event trigger was the other one to monitor DDL. Other shadow table projects, two, 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 PG audit. Um, we've got less than five minutes, so I'm going to skip this. I'm going to go to the important part of who has it. So there are unique versions of PG audit for each version of Postgres, starting with Postgres 9.5. So PG audit 1.0.x came out with Postgres 9.5, and it PG Audit revs their number up for every version of Postgres. Now, uh, the older versions of Amazon, like 9.3 and 9.4, of course, we can never support it. 9.5, the early versions of 9.5 and 9.6 on Postgres don't support it. The later versions do. Their version 12 beta 3 does not support it, but it will be supported in the final release. Uh, Amazon does not technically support anything under the dot one release. So when, uh, when they come out list Postgres 12.1, then they will have support for PG Audit. Microsoft has historically not had this. When I gave my presentation in March, uh, the same presentation in March, they were only out with 10 and all their versions did not support it. They do have 11.4 on. Uh, installed on their machines now. And as of September, they've got PG Audit 1.3 on that Postgres 11. But it's a public preview, which means if you have a service contract with Microsoft and you have a problem with PG Audit, you're on your own. It is not because it is not supported, because it's public preview. Once it comes out of pre public preview, then it will be supported by your service contract with them. Heroku and Google do not support PG Audit. You're out of luck with them. By the way, there are links to all the referencing pages where you can find all this information on this slide. Uh, to, 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 I think we are probably right about time. So I think I'm going to call that an end. I will get this slide deck uploaded. You are welcome to contact me. I'm happy to talk about this stuff at any time. Uh, and do, do, do. Uh, let me, no, not that one. Uh, do, 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 do. Let me go back to the beginning so you can grab where it's at, which also has my contact information on there, do, 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 do. Uh, so that you can get the zip file and the, uh, there. So this is where you can get the zip file and it has the older, ver it has the March version of this presentation. I will have uh, today's presentation uploaded in just a few minutes after this is over. And it has my contact information, it has also to my GitHub where I publish stuff, it has my LinkedIn, everything, so you can contact me, ask me any questions you want. I'm happy to answer them. Yeah. Oh, in fact, I, there was another thing uh, to do. The problem is if you're doing multiple transactions within timestamps, there's an extra thing that you need to do, and that is this. Uh, you can actually put a commit timestamp uh, on your table. You just have to update it after you commit your transaction, and this is the query to do that. Yes? Um, with your time travel, you take the most recent insert and updates before the time you want to travel to. Yes. But if a row is or been, equal. Or equal. Yeah. Let us say a row has been deleted. It has an insert, there's a delete for that row. Mm -hmm. You will pick up the insert, but not the delete, and the row would appear to still be there, would it not? If you do an insert and delete at the same... No, no not at the same Within time. the same transaction, you, you, yeah, you, you the, might have a you problem. You do insert first, mm -hmm. and then a few minutes later, you do a delete. Right. But then your time travel is for a time after the delete. Then it will not show the, the record. Because Why not? It, because it will only, uh, the timestamp query showed it had to be insert or update, uh, 
that it returned, it will ignore all the deleted records. Oh, I see. So your original query is pulling in the deletes, but then that's being and, and then they're discarded. excluding them. That's and why there was an excluded. inner query and an outer query, and the outer query was saying, I only want the inserts and updates. That way it was throwing away the deletes and the truncates. Okay, thank you very much. Yep, you're welcome. I'm afraid we're out of time for questions. Okay, so um, come talk to me uh, afterwards, and I'll, uh, I'm happy to answer more questions. <laughs> <laughs> oh,